In today's world, security has never been more vital. And at FaithWorks Live, we're proud to partner with Veriguard Security. It's a professional physical security service. And they're really raising the bar in security and private investigations. Whether you need a team of professional officers to protect what you have worked hard to build, or their mobile security units for multiple properties or large locations, from business or corporate properties to your home or neighborhood. Perhaps you've got an event coming up. They secure quality security coverage for events large and small because it's about peace of mind and protecting you, your family, your team, and your property. Settle for nothing less than the best when it comes to your security. You shouldn't have to compromise. When it comes to security, you can trust Veriguard. Contact them today at veriguard.us. That's V-A-R-A guard.us. For security service, you can trust Veriguard. Life is good. I'm so glad you're with us. And I'm glad that uh, we are settling in after summer vacation time, at least for us, for um, the Haney House. We're mostly recovered from family vacation, but there was a lot of news that I missed when I was unplugged in a land called Ohio without internet for a while. Not that they don't have it there, but in, in our cabin, we were unplugged. We were trying to take a, a break, a digital break. And then I came back and then the tsunami of news hit. Um, uh, so why not? Why not just be overwhelmed together? No, I we're, we're breaking down the top 10 stories of the summer so far. And uh, we've talked about like three of them so far. One, two, three. I'm losing count. But top 10 lists, very important in radio. I hear that's what all the kids do these days. So let's do, uh, where are we? Number three, the most powerful five minutes that anyone should hear. Everyone in the entire country, in the entire world, should hear Chloe Cole. She deserves a Medal of Honor for speaking out and telling her story, the horrors of so-called gender transition, which is really just medical manipulation. She, she testified before Congress on her 19th birthday. So she's so, so young. And she's speaking out with the, the tragedy of her own life so that it doesn't happen to anyone else. Her story should make every American put on sackcloth and repent in ashes that we've allowed this to be perpetrated on our own children. Everyone needs to hear it. Listen. My name is Chloe Cole, and I'm a detransitioner. Another way to put that would be I used to believe that I was born in the wrong body, and the adults in my life, whom I trusted, affirmed my belief, and this caused me lifelong irreversible harm. I speak to you today as a victim of one of the biggest medical scandals in the history of the United States of America. I speak to you in the hope that you will have the courage to bring the scandal to an end and ensure that other vulnerable teenagers, children, and young adults don't go through what I went through. At the age of 12, I began to experience what my medical team would later diagnose as gender dysphoria. I was well into an early puberty, and I was very uncomfortable with the changes that were happening to my body. I was was intimidated by male attention, and when I told my parents that I felt like a boy, in retrospect, all I meant was that I hated puberty, that I wanted this newfound sexual attention to go away, that I looked up to my brothers a little bit more than I did to my sisters. I came out as transgender in a letter I sent on the dining room table. My parents were immediately concerned. They felt like they needed to get outside help from medical professionals, but this proved to be a mistake. It immediately set our entire family down a path of ideologically motivated deceit and coercion. The gender specialist I was taken to to see told my parents that I needed to be put on puberty-blocking drugs right away. They asked my parents a simple question. Would you rather have a dead daughter or a living transgender son. The choice was enough for my parents to let their guard down, and in retrospect, I can't blame them. This was the moment that we all became victims of so-called gender-affirming care. I was fast-tracked onto puberty blockers and then testosterone. The resulting menopausal-like hot flashes made focusing on school impossible. I still get joint pains and weird pops in my back, but they were far worse when I was on the blockers. A month later, When I was 13, I had my first testosterone injection. It's caused permanent changes to my body. 
My voice will forever be deeper, my jawline sharper, my nose longer, my bone structure um, permanently masculinized, my Adam's apple more prominent, my fertility unknown. I look in the mirror sometimes and I feel like a monster. I had a double mastectomy at 15. They tested my amputated breast for cancer. Now it's cancer free, of course. I was perfectly healthy. There was nothing wrong with my still developing body or my breasts, other than that, as an insecure teenage girl, I felt awkward about it. After my breasts were taken away from me, the tissue was incinerated. Before I was able to legally drive, I had, part, I had a huge part of my future womanhood taken from me. I will never be able to breastfeed. I struggle to look at myself in the mirror at times. I, w I, I, still, I still struggle to this day with sexual dysfunction. And I have massive scars across my chest and the skin grafts that they use, that they took of my nipples, are weeping fluid today. And they were grafted into a more masculine positioning, they said. After surgery, my grades in school plummeted. Everything that I went through did nothing to address my underlying mental health issues that I had. And my doctors, with their theories on gender, thought that all my problems would go away as soon as I was surgically transformed into something that vaguely resembled a boy. Their theories were wrong. The drugs and surgeries changed my body, but they did not and could not change the basic reality that I am and forever will be a female. When my specialist first told my parents that they could have a dead daughter or a live transgender son, I wasn't suicidal. I was a happy child who struggled because she was different. However, at 16, after my surgery, I did become suicidal. I'm doing better now. But my parents almost got the dead daughter promised to them by my doctors. My doctors had almost created the very nightmare they said they were trying to avoid. So what message do I want to bring to American teenagers and their families? I didn't need to be lied to. I needed compassion. I needed to be loved. I needed to be given therapy to help me work through my issues, not affirm to my delusion that by transforming into a boy, it would solve all my problems. We need to stop telling 12-year-olds that they were born wrong that they are right to reject their own bodies and feel uncomfortable with their own skin. We need to stop telling children that puberty is an option, that they can choose what kind of puberty they will go through, just so they can choose what clothes to wear or what music to listen to. Puberty is a rite of passage to adulthood, not a disease to be mitigated. Today, I should be at home with my family celebrating my 19th birthday, and instead I'm making a desperate plea to my elected, rep my elected representatives learn the lessons from other medical scandals like the opioid crisis, to recognize that doctors are human too, and sometimes they are wrong. My childhood was ruined along with thousands of detransitioners that I know through our networks. This needs to stop. You alone can stop it. Enough children have already been victimized by this barbaric pseudoscience. Please let me be your final warning. Thank you. Professing to be wise. We've become utter fools. We've exchanged the glory of immortal God for hollow idols in our own image. Our feelings reign supreme, and we talk about that a lot. Our, our preferences, our desires, but I don't think we take it seriously enough that they are literally holding us slave out to whatever whim we can be convinced will fulfill us, fill that God-shaped hole, so to speak. And not only that, we now hold every other person hostage to our capriciousness. And when children are confused around us, we, we're like sheep without a shepherd. The adults themselves, ourselves, we're acting like a generation of petulant children. We do not see fit to acknowledge God, and he has given us up to the depravity of our own minds. I never th wanted to, to live through Romans 1, and yet here we are in living color. It's exactly the same. We do not see fit to acknowledge God, and so he has given us up to the depravity of our own minds. We invent new forms of evil, as it says in the scripture, and we're sacrificing our own kids, body, mind, and soul to the spirit of the age. And if you, I don't know how you can listen to that and not have your heart break 
And and to me, the most heart-wrenching part of her testimony was hearing not only the destruct, obviously the destruction and the physical harm, the mental, psychological, irrevocable harm that the gender denial surgeries caused. But think about this. Every adult in her life, she was a vulnerable, hurting young girl. She said, I was scared of the changes in my body. I didn't know what to do. And, you know, anyone who's been through puberty can relate, right? Especially for girls. It can, it can you know, change everything about you. You've got all these hormones that your body is producing. It's a natural thing, but it can be scary. And then everyone else's reactions, you're kind of going through this with your peer group. You know, you're, you're trying to figure out a way to fit in. You're probably awkward. And everyone in that moment, everyone that she trusted to protect her, her parents, her counselors, her medical doctors, they affirmed the lie. They told her the lie was the truth because they didn't love her enough to protect her from the lie. That sounds harsh, but I mean every word. I don't know how you could look at that and and think anything differently. They gave her up and they urged her to the distortion instead of the truth. They told her, yes, you're right. You know, your body is the problem. It's wrong. It's, it's a, it's, you, you should hate your own body. And that the solution was to, to distort her, to cut off pieces of yourself. I don't, I don't want to get too graphic, but that's exactly what we're doing. If there's ever a time to be direct, it's now. That's what we're doing to kids. We're cutting them up and claiming it will heal them. And I thank God that she has the courage now to speak out and the presence of mind, the integrity uh, to stand up for she's facing the full throated hatred of the left. She's been called every single name in the book and and she is still speaking up. And I'm so glad that she and people like her, especially young people, are willing to tell the truth. We must speak boldly. I don't think there's any room for silence anymore on something like this. It doesn't mean that you hate, you know, the people that are on the other side. It doesn't mean that you can't do so with kindness and love, but we have to do so with clarity. We cannot allow more people, more children to be captured and enslaved by this monstrous lie that comes from exactly where all lies come from, the father of lies, the enemy of our souls who loves to steal and kill and destroy everything good. We have to uphold the truth. The truth is, so if, I don't know if anybody who fundamentally disagrees with everything I'm saying right now would listen to this. Um, It might be, possibly. I'm going to put it out on the internet and see what happens. But if you hear me and you think, you know, maybe you're confused, maybe you are searching for what's real. Maybe you feel, you don't feel at home in your own skin. And I just want to say that God made you and he made me wonderfully in his image. Very different, I'm sure. He made us male and female. There's no exceptions to that. There's no exchanges. There's no refunds. It's all good. We don't need it. He didn't make a mistake with you. Your body as as strange or imperfect as it might seem in the mirror, especially in middle school or, hey, in middle age, let's, let's face it, I can testify. I look in the mirror and I'm like, all right, that's what we're working with. Okay. But that's not how God sees you. God looks at you and says, you're beautiful. You are precious. You are my child. The same way that if you're a parent or a grandparent or, you know, you can think of, picture that person that you love most and look in their eyes. And that's what God thinks when he looks at you. You are precious to me. Come to me. That's his call. He calls us. If we're weary, we're broken down, we're Way down with confusion or depression or distorted thinking, he says, come to me. He says, I came to heal and restore and make you whole. That, it's not just our bodies, right? But it's, it's specifically in this conversation. But it's all of us. It's our body. It's, he doesn't throw away our bodies. Our bodies are also very important to God. He promises to resurrect us the same way he did with Christ, body and soul together forever. It is It is because of his great love for us 
that he sent Christ to die in the flesh, to live and to die for us so that we can be raised body and soul to live with him. And that is the greatest love story I can imagine. And that is the message that we as Christians have for this confused generation. It's out of that great love. It's an invitation of love. And no louder voices, right? Like the media moguls, the Hollywood uh, elites, the Hollywood predators, the, the academic manipulators, the voices that are out in, on college campuses, political bloviators, or the idolatrous influencers. Anybody out there on social media can drown out. Nobody can drown out the truth of God's love. He is calling us to repent and be redeemed. Every single one of us, that's the best possible message that we can take out into the world. I'm so glad that Chloe Cole is sharing her story, and I can hope and pray that everyone that's out there can share your story, specifically the testimony that you were once lost until you were found in Christ, and you know who you truly are when you know who you are in Christ. That is our true identity. And if it's not yours today, consider this an invitation. Please get in touch with me. FaithWorks Live on Facebook, Rebecca Haney uh, at Outlook.com. That's my personal email. And I, I would love to carry on the conversation about that. Um, because the rest of the world, like I said, we're doing this top 10 list or as many as I can get through because I'm pontificating more than I thought. I guess I'm on fire today, all fired up. Um, but the uh, there's so much going on in the world, so many lies being perpetuated by the world, I should say. So um, I've got stories four and five that to me go together. There was a poll that indicate, because we know that's where the truth is found out there. You just take a survey and figure out what the truth is. But the latest poll um, on the subject of gender that I've seen was uh, in Newsweek. Newsweek put out this poll. 44% of millennials want to make it a crime to misgender someone. Yes, to um, use the wrong pronouns, essentially. To refer to someone by the wrong gender pronoun should be a criminal offense. Wow. Okay, so this was, let's look at the mechanics, 1,500 people, el eligible voters, so 18 and over, in the United States in early July, and I guess, you know, not felons, people who were asked um, whether referring to someone by the wrong gender pronoun, so calling a he, a she, for example, would be a, should be a criminal offense, and it, this is shocking that 44% of younger millennials, so... These would be people that are like um, 25 to 35. 44% uh, favor making this a crime. So that's actually higher than Gen Z, the TikTok kids, right? That shocked me. About 33% of them said that it would be, so this is 18 to 24, said that it should be a crime. And then about 38% of elder millennials, my peeps, so 35 to 44, 38% of y'all said it should be a crime to misgender someone, to call them by the wrong pronoun. I mean, I don't know what else to say. It's, so this is like, 19% of the total survey, so they're talking to some younger, some older people, and that kind of saves it a little bit. About two-thirds of, of the total people uh, surveyed said it should not be criminalized, but 19% said that it should across all age groups, and about 12% did not agree or disagree because they just don't know. And, I mean, that's talk about a, a binary choice. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, again, we try to get away. It's not a spectrum anymore, guys. It's either a binary choice. You either believe in freedom of speech, believe in freedom of conscience, and believe in the right to, if not determine your own pronouns, at least determine what words you are uh, allowed to say, what words you might say or not say. And you don't know that? I, I, the Michigan State Legislature is actually taking this seriously. Like, you can laugh at the fact, oh, those kids these days, they got all kinds of crazy ideas. But these kids, it, it's not that far off from reality. There was a bill passed, so this is another story, by the Democrat-led Michigan State House last month, which would make it a felony for people to threaten others by disrespecting their gender identity. So misgendering somebody... Um, in this bill that, again, passed in Michigan, passed the House, 
It would make it a hate crime to cause someone to feel, quote, terrorized, frightened, or threatened with words by deliberately misgendering them. Holy force speech, Batman. I mean, I would ask, this is like Orwell come to life. I would ask if these folks had ever heard of the First Amendment, but I guess I'm assuming they went to public school. So ask and answered, Your Honor. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I can't with this. Not only do these folks, whether they realized it, um, or I mean, because some people, when they're surveyed, they're, they're just virtue signaling. They're trying to get the right answer, quote unquote. They want to be thought well of. So they're virtue signaling for the wokeness. Or maybe they're, you know, they really believe this. But they're advocating not just for a private or personal denial of reality, not just for social acceptance or uh, humane consideration of this, you know, tiny minority of people. Let's get real. It's like 0.002% of people who actually have gender confusion and everything else is social contagion. Just want to put that out there along with all my other unpopular opinions. Um, but you will be made to care is the bottom line here. You, according to this mindset, you, if you disagree, should be forced to use certain terms. And this is regardless of their objective truth. It's based on um, the third person's feelings, right? We talk about how ridiculous that is because it could be based on a whim. It could change, it could go with the flow. If It could change from day to day, from moment to moment. And you wouldn't know what, you know, a person's pronouns. I guess I'm feeling male today. I guess I'm feeling, you know, non-binary today. Whatever that might be. I'm feeling like a frog self today or fairy kin or whatever kinds of, <laughs> whatever other identities are out there. There's a whole rainbow spectrum. If, uh, you know, that's why kids don't do TikTok. Anyway, regardless of your feelings on the matter, you have to speak what they want you to speak. And if you don't, straight to jail, straight to jail. <laughs> Just, I, I, I'm laughing because it's that ridiculous that they are advocating whether they know it or not, right? Because I'm sure not everybody thought it through. Maybe they're just reacting to what they think. Oh yeah, that's, that's the right politically correct answer. But that's the problem is that the power lies in the hands of people who are committed to a lie and committed, I think it's kind of just a power trip, to get other people to agree to the lie. Because if you can force people to say what they know is not true, then you have ultimate power over them. Like they are no longer master of their own will or master of, you know, let alone critical thinking. That's back there on the bumper, man. We, lo we left that one a long time ago. That's the ultimate power over a fellow human being. It's a huge power trip. They are legislating morality. They're saying the morality police should be the actual police. And this is why, just side note here, just move off with me on a rabbit trail, won't you? Is you should not be cowed into defensiveness. Lots of times I'll see this, um, that conservatives get accused of legislating morality, like when it comes to abortion or marriage or family policy, things like that, social policy. An opponent will say, you're legislating morality, and that's supposed to be a gotcha. Um, and so are they. That's, that's it. Every law is legislating morality, guys. It's just a matter of which morals you're enforcing, whose morals you're enforcing. And going back to the survey, 44% of millennials here, they're not like basement dwellers or teenagers. They're just figuring it out. These are adults. These are everyone under 40, between like 25 and 44. That's millennials. They are business owners. They're professors, probably. They're your blue haired preschool teachers, they're on your city council, they're on your school boards. And from one millennial to another, I, this is not a good look, guys. All right, I defend us with as much as I can over as, as much vigor as I can over my avocado toast from my shiplap kitchen. All right, this is not a good look. Not for anybody, guys. Or I'm sorry, not guys, gender neutral non-binary humanoids who may or may not be capable of pregnancy or, you know, certainly shouldn't be reduced just to their body parts, right? Because we can identify as anything now. Who's it? The sky is the limit. What could, what could possibly go wrong? So I guess I will pick my own identity. I have decided to identify as Queen Galadriel. Ah, Yes. Yes, I think that's the identity that fits me best. So my pronouns are going to be Her Majesty, 
and that is how you must refer to me, and all will love me and despair. Oh man, the clock stops for no one. And uh, there's way more to say, so much to say, so much news to cover, and so little time left in the hour. So that just means we'll have to resume again next time, because uh, I'm paying for this microphone, as Ronald Reagan said. I know not to, to leave. I feel like we need to go back to God's word when we're digging in through the dirt, raking the muck of our cultural collapse in real time. Um, I do believe that we should be, I go, joke about it, but I believe seriously that the joy of the Lord is our strength and we have to be of good cheer. We have to be sober minded and we have to face the truth. And even in all of its ugliness, we have to face it head on. We cannot run away. We can't turn our, avert our eyes because it's ugly, but we have to, we have to fight differently, right? I talk about armoring up because this is a, primarily a spiritual battle. It's a battle for the soul. And uh, I've been really thinking about uh, Ephesians 5, really, for the last several days. And it talks, uh, and Paul talks quite a bit to the, to the Ephesian church about this picture of Christ and the church, of husband and wife as, um, as a symbol of or as a picture of Christ and the church. And he talks about us imitating God and walking in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a sacrifice. So how then should we live? Because he gets super practical in chapter Ephesians chapter five. He talks about not being impure. He says, whether that's the words that we use or the joking that we do, um, our sexual behavior, our choices, our, our choices to covet or desire, like we're not supposed to be impure in any way, and that that should help us stand out from the rest of the world. That will make our inheritance sure, and then we are not to be deceived with empty words. So this is picking up about verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness. Not that you did a few bad things here and there and it was all right because you swept it under the rug. No, at one time you were darkness, but now you are the light. You are light in the Lord. We have that new identity. Walk then, he says, as children of the light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. I try to make sure I'm skirting around the edges of that. We shed the light. That's what we're doing. We shed the light because, so Ephesians 5.13, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And that's our word of hope. And that is a choice that we all can make every single day. Do not take any part in the darkness, because that was old. That was then. That's a long time ago. That, that's the old you. That's gone. Now you are light in the Lord, so we walk as children of the light. Thanks for listening. I uh, hope you catch us next time. If there is next time, I haven't been canceled yet. If you hear my voice again, um, if you never hear my voice again, I guess, just remember that we have a mission. So it's time to be about it. There's no time like right now. You're listening to FaithWorks Live. There's no better time than now to stand for life. And you can stand with Iowa's original pro-life organization, Pulse for Life. They're the longest standing nonprofit pro-life organization in Iowa, and they are dedicated to informing, educating, and inspiring a new generation to value the sanctity of all human life from fertilization until natural death. They serve at the state house. They educate in classrooms at events. They proudly serve on the coalition of pro-life leaders. They are on the front lines of of the battle against this throwaway culture of death that we see all around us, and we are winning ground. Hearts and minds are changing, and the pro-life movement is continuing to grow. And you can be a part of the exciting things that are happening right here in our own backyard at pulseforlife.org and get your finger on the pro-life pulse. Sign up for their newsletter, find ways that you can make a difference, and how you can change hearts and minds with their pro-life apologetics course. 
pulseforlife.org.